Perfect. Okay, so a little bit about the epidemiology of uh, of uh, TBI and um, OCD. If you read most of the papers out there, they'll it'll say that there's not a lot of uh, this is a rare condition in traumatic brain injury, but symptoms of OCD have been described in papers up to 14% from a prevalence standpoint. Uh, but it goes from as low as 1% all the way to 14%. And again, that's not a diagnosis. That is patients experiencing symptoms that could be consistent with either obsessive compulsive or obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so there's not a real clear epidemiological studies uh, or study defining the prevalence of this condition from a pretty much extensive review of the literature. Uh, but, and, and partly because there are a lot of uh, sample bias in brain injury and also in psychiatry, because when you look at the, the methodologies, the tools, the selection of patients, the complexity of the brain and how we evaluate people with organic injuries to the brain, uh, it introduces a lot of biases. So when you think of studies from a cohort standpoint, the ability to properly identify these patients with OCD or OCD-like features are sometimes quite difficult. And I'll talk about that as I move along. So the other point is that the tools that are used um, in psychiatry are not often applicable, particularly when you analyze, when you ask the patient self-reporting. So if a patient with language problems on aphasia or sometimes they have trouble with, uh, with um, uh, processing of information and so forth, their ability to respond uh, in an appropriate way to answer what their experience is, is sometimes, it's sometimes compromised. So as a result, people with or without symptoms might be either misclassified, misdiagnosed, underreported. Uh, and the whole issue is, are we asking the right questions? When you think about uh, persons with what we call so-called organic problems, where there is a structural or physiological injury, from whatever reason, um, those uh, issues are posed. So <clears throat> it, is, it is challenging, <clears throat> excuse me, to say the least, uh, from a definition standpoint. And the, the challenge with the DSM is a sort of uh, a unidimensional way of looking at the brain. Uh, because you take signs and symptoms and you combine them together and if they fit a certain profile, then you give the diagnosis. And the reason why this, the, this tool was developed in psychiatry is that it helps to properly classify psychiatric disease. And we've used that for years as a methodology to treat patients, to select drugs, to make sure we pick the right drugs, if we classify them properly. But the challenge is that when you think of a person with a neurological disease or disorder with structural injury, oftentimes they may have the same symptoms, but the classification may be entirely wrong uh, because of the structural issues in the brain. Okay. Now, so from the standpoint of um, you know, how we define those uh, issues in terms of um, uh, physiological or diagnostic tools or how we actually, uh, when we question a, a patient or get a clinical history, there are significant uh, differences. So let's look at how DSM-5 defines OCD. And of course, DSM, you know, you have the A and B and the one, two, three uh, classification system that, and this, the class, the main class, subclass of signs and symptoms. And of course, symptoms are what the patient described and signs are what we find as clinicians. So the first would be <clears throat> the, the obsessive 
um, uh, the obsession. And uh, an obsession is more of a concept, it's more of a thought that uh, recurs, it persists, it's intrusive, it's unwanted, it makes the person feel uncomfortable um, and causes anxiety and distress. And of course, the whole issue of um, the, the constant attempt to suppress such thoughts. Uh, and when you talk to the patient, they tell you how overwhelming this could become. It consumes the entire day or the activity that prevents them from being productive. And so the compulsion is more of the behavior, the repetitive behavior uh, that people engage in, uh, the rules that they set up for themselves. And of course, I already alluded on the B side would be the fact that it's time consuming and it clinically causes distress and impairs one's ability to function. So those are the basic criteria we need based on DSM to, to be able to diagnose this condition. Now, when you think of the, the same type of disorder in the context of the neurosciences, and particularly in traumatic brain injury, uh, the, <clears throat> the current studies, when you look at post-TBI uh, psychopathology related to OCD, it's influenced by many factors. Uh, first, the uh, factors of the structural basis. And again, this is more multidimensional than unidimensional. Uh, so you have to think of it in terms of what are all of the factors that uh, would contribute to a person experiencing this type of symptomology or the condition or whether or not they meet the true criteria to OCD. And this is more of what we call the acquired form of the disease. Uh, so um, basically, uh, there is a neuroanatomic and physiological basis, which I'll talk about in a minute, to this, uh, this injury. And of course, some of the premorbid factors that people may have developed from prior experiences. Uh, they may have had a previous injury that made them vulnerable or may have OCD tendencies for other reasons. Uh, there could be environmental stressors that includes their own feelings about themselves, their self-esteem, their feelings of loss, uh, and recreating anxiety. One of the things that you would see, the issues you would see in people with TBI and concussion is that intense feeling that they experience after the injury. I mean, I've, I've treated students uh, with concussions for years at the University of Miami in the concussion clinic. And you take the students, they're accustomed to getting A's. They're brilliant. They're doing really fine. All of a sudden, after a concussion, they can't process. They can't deal with paying attention and focuses. And they go from A's to C's and D's. And they have a lot of trouble dealing with that significant loss that they experience. And so that creates anxiety and panic disorder and sometimes leads to OCD. So we see this as a... Uh, a real, uh, those environmental factors of uh, the expectations of society uh, in, in the typical person with brain injury. Um, another factor that we look at is the early symptoms versus the late symptoms. Um, what, what you call the acute, uh, there's the OCD-like symptoms that presents right after the injury in the acute period. And generally speaking, if the symptoms that the patient's both physical, emotional, and neuropsychological symptoms do not resolve themselves within a short period of time, the chances of someone developing OCD or OCD-like or acquired OCD is much higher than a person that would have been treated uh, early. One of the reasons why we favor early intervention for people with concussion and TBI is so that you avoid some of these compensatory uh, conditions that develop. And I consider in the world of TBI, OCD to be a compensatory uh, uh, condition that the brain develops as a result of the vulnerabilities that occur. It's slightly contrary to what you see in the psychiatric um, area. Of course, the issue of psychological and emotional support. Many times, the society that you live in and the that you culturize in contributes to the condition. 
For example, in OCD, a lot of times the, your friends and your family actually make the condition worse by some of the things they say or they, them trying to help you without having a full knowledge or understanding that they're actually making the condition worse for you. And that's a common situation that we see in persons with OCD across the board. And certainly that's one of the jobs of the psychologists is to try to work on educating the family members and also the patients about these triggers that are often present. So the, the question that we always ask, there's a field now called neuropsychiatry, which is kind of a combination of neurology and psychiatry. It's more psychiatry than neurology, I always say. But in traumatic brain injury, it really is a neurological disorder because it involves both physiological and structural injury that's acquired to the brain. And so what happens with people with this disorder they present with uh, conditions that are traditionally neurological with psychiatric manifestation. The fundamental problem we have in the brain injury world is that we use pure DSM and psychiatric tools and treatment modalities to treat people with structural physiological injury. And that's where we err. That's where we make a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes, and we actually sometimes make patients worse. Even in the choice of medications, the choice of non-pharmacological therapy. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll continue on that theme as we go through. So the neuropsychiatric challenge in brain injury, first is with persons with OCD, is this, what are the cognitive factors? Generally speaking, people with OCD are pretty bright, they're pretty insightful. They have a good understanding of what's going on. They pay more attention to details than most others. Uh, generally, when you look at a person with a neurological basis with OCD-like symptoms, they tend to have more cognitive disabilities, memory and attentional problems, sensory motor integration issues, and very important disorders of executive functions. And that comes because of the anatomic locations of the types of injuries that you see. Uh, and by executive function, we mean the higher functions, what we call the higher cortical functions, that results in problems of processing of information, the speed of processing, the ability to focus and pay attention. And when you think of persons with Parkinson's disease and Huntington's chorea, and those conditions that have similar disorder, they tend to have a lack. Contrary to something like um, Tourette's syndrome, where the patients are highly intelligent, uh, but yet they have the tics and they have many of the repetitive behavior. So it's a fascinating disorder in the sense that uh, at one point the brain is overstimulated and the, broad, the other point the brain is underactive in certain ways. And so that's what's fascinating about this disorder. In, in, if you look at it more from the psychiatric context, most of the time it's an overactivation of certain neuronal circuitry. While in the structural basis, you could have both on the activity of certain act, uh, brain activities and overactivity of others. And one of our main challenge in the diagnostic evaluation of OCD is in our ability to um, structurally, to decide when we're exciting and when, we, uh, when, we, when we're excitatory and when we inhibitor. Uh, so those are some of the issues that we are not able to delineate in this uh, type of modeling. So the, the DSM uh, criteria already alluded to, um, when you think about DSM on a psychiatric basis, what we call, they, they tend to define disorders in terms of primary um, psychiatric conditions. And then uh, we think of it when we have structural issues as secondary uh, due to medical causes. Uh, and that's the way the DSM tries to uh, delineate between pure psychiatric disorders and non-psychiatric disorders that presents with those traditional type of uh, classification of OCD and other conditions. So I already alluded to the fact that the primary diagnostic tools that we use in psychiatry are not available in neurology. The self-reporting, we have them, but it's very, sometimes we have to depend on the family to fill those out. 
and they may not understand how to fill those out. Or the patient themselves may not be able to describe what they're experiencing. And so some of these standardized interviews that psychiatrists do, we don't have that available to us in neurology to an extent. I mean, our examination is most structural. And then, of course, we have the mental status exam. But when you think about someone that has, <clears throat> say, um, a disorder <clears throat> of apraxia, where they can't follow a certain sequence to perform a task. So they revert to a kind of repetitive behavior. Maybe uh, something called perseveration, where they stay on a task and do it over and over and over. They're doing that task because they can't shift their attention from one thing to the other. Uh, and that we call perseveration, that's more for frontal lobe executive function. Well, in many cases, someone could consider that as a repetitive behavior and classify it as an OCD-like behavior, when in fact is a true neurological deficit. So those are some of the challenges we have when we think of those disorder in those terms. Um, so I, I did already talk about this whole issue about this in neuroscience, we think of apathy and hypoarousal that we see in patients. They fatigue, they have no energy. Um, and um, so um, this is important uh, when you think about disorders like depression and anxiety. So we see a patient, their face may look very sad and you think they're depressed, they may not be. It's just that their facial expression, they don't have the ability to express themselves. Generally speaking, these disorders fit into a category called dysprosodias, a prosodic disorders, where they have the inability to show the emotional content in their communication. So you might interpret them as being depressed or anxious when they're neither. It's just that the way they look clinically to, to the observer is that they're depressed when they may not be, or they may not necessarily be anxious. They may be apathetic, meaning they have this desire to constantly move, they can't sit still. It could be caused by a drug. Uh, and generally that's a dopaminergic reaction in the brain. We see this commonly in conditions like Parkinson's and even in conditions like uh, uh, Tourette's syndrome. But it's very common in the brain injury population. So the whole idea is that, you know, what are your diagnoses and what are you treating? This is a study that was done um, looking at, well, no, actually, not the study yet. I, I want to just talk about looking at OCD from the psychiatric perspective and neurological perspective. So when you take the categories, first starting with cognitive disorders, primarily memory, attention, and executive function. It's not a general problem when you see with OCD in the psychiatric population, but this is very commonly seen in persons with OCD-like symptoms or OCD classification uh, on the neurological cases. Uh, generally, these people take a person with memory problems or attentional problems. They have this pressured speech. They're talking and they don't want to forget what they're going to say. So they're talking at 90 miles an hour. Sometimes we classify them as, uh, as bipolar even because they, they don't take a breath between their conversation because they're afraid that they're going to lose their trend of thought or their ability to focus, or their mind might wander away. Until, so they develop this behavior of talking really fast. Okay, and people think that it's an obsessive type of behavior. They can't wait, you can't interrupt them. I have a patient that I talk about in my book, who I treated from Guyana, and one of the things I observed is that in, in evaluating her, if I stopped at any moment to ask a question, she has to go back and tell the entire story. Uh, and obsessed about it that if you interrupt her, she would get anxious and feel extremely upset. But really and truly, when we tested her, she had very severe attentional deficits and could not stay on task. And that's her way of compensating for herself. So in fact, that's a treatment. For her, it was a treatment. It was a way of overcoming that major disability. So in fact, here's a case where we often go out and say, oh, let's try to correct this. Well, if you correct that problem, you actually make her worse. So because then she feels more anxious and more insecure because then in a conversation, she can't finish. Then she feels embarrassed that she's not able to accomplish what uh, she was able to. So again, those are some of the issues. The, the major one that I always see is this, the physical disorder. 
that patients present with. When you think about the issue of uh, sleep-wake disorders, people can't sleep at night, okay? They have trouble falling asleep. There's a fair amount of anxiety that you see in brain injury patients. When they have trouble falling asleep, they ruminate. Their thoughts are going on and on at night and can't, yeah, can't, um, can't fall asleep. So night times become scary. They, be, they, they develop lots of obsession. They get up, they eat all the time. Their body tells them that they need energy. They check the fridge 50 times. They check the door 50 times. So these patients tend to develop this because they can't sleep at nights. And that's usually due to an overactivity of the limbic system, okay? And that's easily treated. We give them a drug that quiets the limbic system, they fall asleep with no problem, and pretty soon that OCD symptom goes away. So um, another one we see is that of sensory overload. The nervous system has, as part of it, has an input, it has a process, and it has an output. On the input level, are all of our sensory experiences, like noise, motion, uh, sensation of feeling, vibration. All of those sensory phenomena actually come through our peripheral system and they go through the uh, thalamus. That's our relay station. When there is an injury in the thalamus or the relationship with the thalamus and the cortical fibers or any of the messaging center that gets from the ear, for example, the auditory or the vestibular system, there's a disruption in that message. So the message is interpreted wrongly or falsely, and therefore the response is in error. That's why people experience vertigo and dizziness, or when they go into an environment where the sensory becomes overwhelming, they can't tolerate it. So of course, they start withdrawing and avoiding. Uh, and, and that's where this whole sense of insecurity and feelings of hopelessness and anxiety comes in. This, in many cases in TBI, is the root cause of OCD-like symptoms. And for many of these patients, it's a, literally a compensatory behavior that the brain develops. And, and we produce rituals in order to, um, uh, to do this. This could occur with when there is uh, overload of sensory, but it could also occur when there is sensory deprivation, where there is such reduction in the input. So I have a patient that's not completely blind because of an occipital injury, occipital load damage, uh, where um, they develop something called Anton syndrome, where they literally see colors and pictures when they're not there. They could imagine those things. The brain does that on its own. And he's developed the worst OCD symptoms that you would ever imagine. And that gives him security. Yeah? And that compensates for his lack of vision. So when there's sensory deprivation of any kind, OCD-like behavior, they, they, it gives security. So rituals, if, you know, uh, blind people tend to have rituals. They, they have a stick that they use to, they count tiles, they count the distance, how much they walk. So that's an OCD-producing behavior. But it's a learned behavior that they use to actually get better or to allow them to function in society. So my point being is that while OCD becomes pathologic in certain situations, in our population of brain injury, it's often a compensatory and it could work for the patient and against the patient. Let's take the emotional issues. I already alluded to the fact that a patient would experience emotional loss as a result of uh, OCD, as, as a result of uh, an injury. Like the student who was scoring an A and now is getting a D and doesn't want to tell their parents uh, and so forth. And that, the, the rituals that they had to go through, they don't want to disclose it to their friends that they're getting a poor grade. So they invent rituals in order to prevent that information from being leaked out because of the embarrassment that it caused. And over time, the brain learns those patterns and when other injury occur, they recall those patterns. So this fear of failure, um, the recall of an incident, similar to what happens in patients with uh, uh, PTSD. Of course, the premorbid factors and prior trauma. Um, and so uh, in the brain injury population, many of these issues and these compensatory situations 
are very common as compared to the psychiatric situation. And many of them are present in bo both. So the aim of um, uh, this study uh, talks about um, neuropsychiatric disorder after traumatic brain injury. And it was done at the Department of Neuroscience Rehabilitation um, and the Santa Lucia Foundation in Rome. It's a very interesting study. Um, I have the reference there. But the aim of that study was to obtain a comprehensive description of psychiatric disorders in a population of severe TBI patients using the, the um, NPI, which is a, a commonly used um, psychiatric tool uh, to report uh, psychiatric conditions. Uh, and so trying to use these kinds of tools in neurological disorder is very interesting because many times the interpretation is not um, appropriate. So some of the most apathy, irritability, and uh, it, that's what you talk commonly see in patients with brain injury. And clearly the challenge we have is how do we classify those? I mean, these are descriptive diagnostic domains, but in terms of how we classify them in a DSM category is very challenging because of the organic nature of those. And this actually, it's a, I mean, you could actually look at it later on, but it, it shows you based on the percentages of patients with Glasgow form of eight and below, how many of those patients experience these typical psychiatric symptoms. And again, how are they, the, so now we, 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 we in the psychiatric world, we see these patients say, go see a psychiatrist because you have apathy, you have irritability, you dysphoric and depressed, but take depression. Why is the patient emotionally labor? Why are they crying out of context, incongruent to the situation? Are they truly depressed? They're not. Most people have a condition called pseudobulba affect with brain injury, and it's a different condition. But they cry for things that they shouldn't cry about. They may laugh inappropriately, but oftentimes that's classified in the psychiatry world or in the neurology world as depression when it's truly not. And it's not really a mood disorder in, in many cases. Of course, many patients with TBI concussions voice suicide. In fact, most of them do because they feel so hopeless, but it's an impulsive decision. They voice it in their, in their minds or they express it for very brief moments, while a, a patient with psychiatric disorder might plan it and have a more structured approach, but maybe they get a disappointment and immediately they think of killing themselves. And in that population of patients, you really can't hospitalize them because the moment you talk to them, they're not suicidal anymore, but 10 minutes before they were. And that's the challenge in managing this population of patients. So I'm just giving you some examples. This, this, this so-called compulsive eating disorders that you see in brain injury, a lot of times is due to structural injury to the satiety center in the brain. Or it's also due to the fact that the body tells the patient that it needs energy when the body really doesn't. The brain cycles are screwed up. And the, when you actually fall and you, you eat, your body is saying you need energy. So you have the desire to eat. And that's where this obsessive compulsive eating conditions stem from. So in a way, how do you correct things like that is basically correcting the energy sensation, the problem that that person feels that they need energy. And many times, you know, looking at just the behavior or the do domain could mislead you because if you're not dealing with the causative factors that's driving that behavior, you may use a therapeutic modality that could in fact be harmful to the patient. Um, so take this whole issue of delusions, another one. Most often we say hallucinations, patients, but they're really, most brain injury patients don't experience hallucination. They really experience delusions. They literally see something and they misinterpret it as something else, right? Psychiatric patients tend to see more hallucinations, but more often it's classified as delusions. So guess what? We put them on psychotropic drugs to treat delusions that are structurally based when they should 
be an, another form of treatment like an anti-epileptic drug or maybe or a psychological therapy. Um, the, the issue of anxiety generally is, is present because either of a loss or negative symptom that the patient is experiencing rather than organically based, uh, not inorganically based uh, anxiety. So what's the tendency of the brain in this uh, condition? The brain loves patterns, okay? If you look at the nervous system in terms of how it's built hierarchically, it's a very structured system. That's why my book uh, was called Brain Hierarchical and Evaluation Treatment Method, the method in the book, because it looks at the brain in hierarchical structure and the brain is injured in hierarchical manner and it recovers hierarchically. So you have to understand where you are in the cycle of that hierarchical injury to determine what type of pattern that you see with brain injury. Oftentimes, if you look at just the sign and symptoms and you don't understand where you are in that multidimensional manner, you could be misled in terms of your diagnosis and treatment. The brain learns the most powerful form of learning known to, the, to humans is called associate learning. And that is the brain, similar to the Pavlovian model, where you ring the bell, dog comes, feeds the dog, the dog salivate. You take the bell, you take the food away, the dog continues to salivate. What happens in these forms of learning is that the brain develops pathways that are laid down permanently. And we develop this over years. And that's how we learn to cope. So one experience that you learn that behavior, you utilize it in other experiences that you have. And in a neurological basis, the brain is constantly going back to those coping mechanisms and re either recreating ones that are there or creating new ones. Once those behaviors learn, it's very difficult to unlearn them. And that's one of the challenges in neuroscience is how we unlearn behavior that has association. OCD is an associate learned behavior. In, in the structural basis uh, from a functional standpoint. So many of the drivers are emotional, cognitive, physical, and of course there are both pre-morbid and genetic factors which are more operant in the psychiatric population. So on an anatomic basis, what's the anatomic basis for OCD in persons with uh, traumatic brain injury? and other neurological disorders. There are some clear findings on diagnostic testing and also on autopsy studies showing that there is structural damage to the frontal limbic subcortical system. So between the orbital frontal cortex, which is the most commonly injured part of the brain, and the, um, the limbic system and some of the subcortical structures in the um, Quadric nucleus, there is evidence that um, when there is overactivity in some parts and underactivity in others, the OCD tendency uh, develops. Um, and certainly, another study looked at it and, and um, uh, looked at the frontal basal ganglia thalamic system. So, you remember I talked to you about input, process, and output? This is illustrated here. So the thalamic structures is where the input comes in. The basal ganglionic structures are the first level of processing that occurs from a processing operational output standpoint. And it's more refined in the cortical structures. But you also need the, 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 the um, limbic system to add the emotional record because that's where you store part of the a singular gyrus is where you, and the amygdala is where you store all of these experiences of negativity and positivity, positive and negative experiences. So from that point, point, you have that draw of storage of information that you could relate to, that the brain could quickly access. And so the hippocampus is very involved in some of that processes because then the hippocampus brings that information to, goes to the frontal lobe, asks for relevance. How important is this emotionally? And if it's relevant, of course, it's going to encode. And once it encodes, you know, long-term potentiation with repeated use of that circuitry occurs, that's when that habit 
that's when that OCD behavior become um, permanent. And again, when that's associated with both negative and positive behavior, it becomes impossible for that person to let go. Now, in this slide, if you look right there, this is an example of a patient with a tumor in the medial portion of the temporal lobe uh, in, the, in the limbic system, causing very OCD-like behavior. And here are some examples of a TBI patient with lesions in the orbital frontal, um, the, uh, of course, close to the caudate nucleus, and uh, of course, in the temporal region. And so when you have lesions in all of those entire circuitry, and one of the problems we have is delineating which one is entirely responsible for what. Uh, the challenge is, is that uh, when you look at, for example, PET studies, and, um, which is positive emission tomography, um, uh, and SPEC studies, which uh, um, look at single photon emission uh, computerized tomography, these are physiological studies where you give isotopes and we can see the activity of a cell in the brain, how active that area is relative to uh, perfusion and circulation. It gives you the, the level of metabolism that's going on. And we can label now, we have the ability to label certain proteins uh, uh, to be able to tell us what kind of activities is going on. And what they've shown is that um, in some groups of patients, um, when with non-treated patients with the, um, uh, the acquired and idiopathic forms of OCD, they document hyperactivity within those circuits. Uh, and most of those involve orbital frontal, as I said before, caudate uh, nucleus, the cingulate gyrus, and both in right and left hemisphere. So in many cases, there is hyperactivity in those systems. But there are some regions of the brain where you can see some underactivities also measured in terms of neuronal pools. And so the whole idea of this complex circuitry of information of, of, of when certain things is excitatory and we need to slow it down, and certain things are inhibiting and we need to speed it up. And that's the challenge we have both from a neuropharmacological and psychological manner. I did in my ch in chapter 43, where I talked about associate learning, refer to a case of a patient with OCD that with extreme anxiety and panic attack, experiencing um, OCD type behavior and how those ritualistic behavior uh, acquire. Again, I talked a little bit about the whole idea of the hierarchical organization of the brain and understanding those different levels of interaction based on the input, because it's not just in those areas that I define, uh, but some of the messaging system that uh, comes into the brain causes certain negative reactions that could result in, or positive reactions that could result in OCD. So the BEF method, what's referred to the brain hierarchical evaluation and treatment method, utilizes the concept of understanding the brain hierarchy in a multidimensional manner such that we could know where we are in what causes what symptoms and condition and find the relationships and then effectively evaluate, diagnose, and treat. Again, I already alluded to many of the diagnostic tools, MRI, CT, CAT scan, PET scan, functional MRI, and SPEC scanning. Also, there are some electrical studies now being done in uh, EEGs that also are being used, uh, computerized using artificial intelligence uh, that has some future uh, significance. So quickly about treatment. From our standpoint, our focus is basically to treat the underlying condition and triggers. Our approach is treat those first, and then the behavioral symptoms generally will re uh, resolve. The second principle is treat early before the brain gets to do its compensation. If the brain already made the association, you're already too late. And many times it's impossible to reverse that learned behavior. We could attenuate it, we could modify it, but once the brain learns it, it's hard to unlearn. And sometimes we have to use pharmacological and non-pharmacological uh, uh, methods to block that um, execution.
or to reduce the input triggers that uh, cause this type of condition. So clearly there is you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Of course, a form of that would be exposure and response therapy. A lot of this you guys are familiar with. There are different medications that we use the, uh, to treat this. And it's in, in, the, in the traumatic brain injury area, very controversial, but we focus on treating the physical symptoms first, uh, the cognitive behavioral symptoms after. If you treat the headaches, if you treat the, the dizziness and vertigo, you reduce the avoidance. You reduce the compensatory behavior development. And that's the heart of treating these conditions. So we treat the sleep-wake disorders. We don't just give them sleeping pills, but we put drugs to help them lower certain overactivity in the brain, like lamictal and uh, some of the anticonvulsants. They're very effective in managing these patients at an early stage. In our area, we rarely use psychotropic drugs because they tend to make patients worse. And so those are some of the, the, the we, we, we like to use those to a lesser degree. Um, uh, the benzos do have a place, uh, particularly when you're treating the vertigo and some of those other symptoms, mostly on the input side when the messages are coming in. But when you get to the point where they have already learned that behavior, they tend to be, this patient because addiction is also, has the same basis of associate learning you tend to create more addiction behavior in the long term. It's more difficult to treat. But we do use benzos mostly in the early stages to help avoid getting to that stage. Other tools include DBS, which is a more modern where they put electrodes in certain parts of the brain and stimulate. Those areas were underactive. You stimulate them. Um, and of course, they, they become uh, stimulated. And those stimulated areas uh, naturally inhibits other areas that needs to be inhibited. Because as you know, the brain is a disinhibitory system. The other tool is the trans uh, cranial magnetic stimulation. Um, we're still learning about that tool. Um, not always effective, but uh, supposedly if you treat some of the negative symptoms, then the patient naturally improve. Um, but there's not a lot available in the literature on this tool at this point. We have to be careful when we use it in patients with structural lesions because it could cause seizures at time. So one of the, the, the questions I'm gonna leave you with is, um, and to think about is that when does, when uh, we know that OCD hurts patients, right, with TBI, but, the question is, does it also help? Could we use OCD as a treatment modality to help our patients? And I'll say with a resounding yes. Some of the therapeutic modalities that we use in brain injury actually produce OCD, but it actually helps our patients overcome certain deficits. So it's a fascinating topic, and it's important to know when to do what. So that's the end. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. We only have five minutes because uh, we're all going to jump into our uh, patients at one. Um, I, I, I do want to bring a, a question, though, um, is that when you talk about treating with OCD, um, you mean treating with structures of more uh, structure executive function training or more habitual repetitive behaviors, and those would not qualify for OCD because in OCD, in order to uh, create those, we will have to create the anxiety associated with the experience. And also, uh, when someone does something because of OCD, uh, it's not that they are repeating a behavior. Repetitive behavior is not an OCD behavior. Actually, the quality of the behavior, the emotions of the behavior, and how it, it feels if you can't do it, it's what qualifies OCD. So, so in OCD world, in treatment, we would say that uh, learning to repeat something over and over to uh, increase your function is actually a functional behavior that is learned as a repetitive behavior. But repetitive behaviors are not OCD behavior. You may, um, in, in kids with autism even, we see very, very common, very repetitive behaviors, and we, we wouldn't consider them OCD. Only it would be OCD if they are affecting your function and not contributing to your function. So yeah, you're right. Well, based on the DSM criteria, that is uh, absolutely the case. Uh, 
which is the B um, under that classification. So, the, but the, the, the challenge we have in um, brain injuries, a lot of patients develop OCD behavior with the therapeutic modalities that they've been exposed to. Because, you know, we have this concept in the rehab sometime that we're going to push you as hard as we can. Mm -hmm. And as a result, or they, they become defensive, or they, they, they have some negative experience. One of the big ones we see is in vestibular therapy, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times, we, in our therapeutic, we produce, we, we trigger, you know, uh, patients' responses uh, to have OCD-type responses because the, the therapeutic experience is so negative. What's your, I mean, what you guys approach to a lot of the patients you guys see sometimes, you see them long after they've been treated by neurologists and psychiatrists and, and therapists. Now, right? Sometimes, uh, yeah. but go ahead, Katja, do you want to? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. So, so I said sometimes it's, you know, what, what you're speaking about is, is so helpful. Thank you so much. But it reminds me of the kind of challenge we have in treating OCD combined with ADHD, where it's kind of, or bipolar, where it's kind of on this impulsive compulsive spectrum. And the challenge is to do the things for ADHD, which provides structure and organization, but not let that become OCD and not, you know, and, and vice versa, to find, to find a, a balance there. So it's, it strikes me that, you know, a few issues struck me, but um, I'll just mention a couple. One, one is that it strikes me that there's a very sweet spot in terms of, uh, in terms of managing uh, these kind of patients where you have to kind of keep the habits that are compensatory and decrease the distress level and, and, and any other way that there's an interference with functioning. And it seems to me there's a sweet spot in there that actually is, is very important to find. You know, and, and I was also just a kind of a technical thing, I could be wrong about this, but I think in DSM, you know, it's interesting, you know, what you're saying about the misapplication of DSM, although I, I do want to note that often it says, unless better explained by, you know, an organic process. Yes. So by definition, a lot of these patients you wouldn't say they have OCD, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the way Pachu was saying, they have, they have uh, symptoms that resemble, uh, that are obsessive and compulsive, but not what we would classify as an o o OCD a syndrome. But I, I really hear your point that treating these as, per se, as psychiatric symptoms when they are, are due to something else is a real problem. And we do see that with many of our patients who have, you know, not just uh, TBI, but also medical injuries, particularly with ath young athletes. We've seen a lot of people who have concussions and they're being treated psychiatrically without really that much, you know, it's probably referrals to, to you, but, but they, uh, without really much attention to the fact that the way they came about OCD was, was quite different than is, so, than is uh, typical because it's exacerbated or caused by the right. concussion. So, so what I want to do is I want to say to Dr. Ned, we have to sit on a panel together and continue this conversation because it's been lovely. I think we all have a bunch um, and it's been great. We, I'll follow up with you uh, today or tomorrow so we can kind of move on and continue collaborating. And guys, I know everybody has a patient at one o'clock, so we want to thank you so much yes. for your time. Um, Very appreciate it. Again. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank and thank congrats, you. congrats on the new book. Thank really you. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank Bye. you.